In the previous lesson, you learned about binary phase shift keying, or BPSK for short. In this lesson, you will learn how the spectral efficiency can be improved with pulse shaping. A BPSK signal based on square pulses has poor spectral efficiency. The baud rate for a given bandwidth just isn't adequate for most wireless data applications. The problem stems from the discontinuities in the wave. Sudden changes of phase result in sudden changes of amplitude, and these have a big impact on the range of frequencies occupied by the signal. For that reason, modern digital communication systems often include pulse shaping to limit the bandwidth of the transmitted signal. Pulse shaping is applied to the baseband signal after line coding, but before modulation. To appreciate the ideas behind pulse shaping, consider again the work of Joseph Fourier. He showed that any wave can be constructed by adding together a combination of simple sine and cosine waves, as long as there are enough of them. The mathematical process is known as the Fourier transform. Even a square wave like this can be created by adding sine waves together. You don't have to be a mathematician to notice that building a wave with perfectly square corners would mean adding together a very large number of sine waves. An infinite number of them, in fact. But we can get a pretty good approximation with only a few. Clearly, then, a square wave, with all of its very sudden changes in amplitude, is made up of many different frequencies. These frequencies are known as harmonics. It follows, then, that if we were to view just one square pulse of a baseband signal on a chart of frequency against amplitude, it's going to look something like this. Each ripple corresponds to one of the many harmonics that make up the pulse. Let's be clear, this view of the square pulse in the so-called frequency domain is a snapshot of the frequencies that are occupied at just one moment in time. This particular shape is known as the sync function. It's the result of performing a Fourier transform of a square pulse. In fact, because an infinite number of frequencies are needed to make a perfectly square pulse, a sync function must extend infinitely in both directions. By the way, in mathematical terms, the square pulse is known as a rectangular function, or a rect function for short. A square wave, a sequence of square pulses, also gives rise to a sync function in the frequency domain. If the data rate of the baseband signal was higher, then each square pulse would be narrower in the time domain but the sync function would be more spread out in the frequency domain. Intuitively, this stands to reason. The bandwidth would need to be wider to accommodate a higher data rate. Now, when a square pulse is multiplied by a sinusoidal carrier, a carrier with a particular frequency, which we'll call omega, then the sync function will maintain its general shape but will be displaced in the frequency domain by the amount omega. So this is what the frequency spectrum of a BPSK signal would look like in the frequency domain. Think of it this way. A BPSK signal has lots of sudden changes in amplitude, just like a square wave. So its frequency spectrum also includes harmonics extending infinitely in both directions. This inefficient use of the frequency spectrum is far from ideal. So what can be done about it? We've seen that a rect function in the time domain is a sync function in the frequency domain. Well, rather conveniently, a sync pulse in the time domain is a rect function in the frequency domain. Therefore, by making a square pulse in the time domain, look more like a sync function, we can make the sync function in the frequency domain look more like a square pulse. A rect function in the frequency domain would be ideal because it has a limited bandwidth. In practice, things are not that simple. 
For a start, a perfect sync pulse in the time domain would have to extend infinitely into the past and the future, which of course is impossible. Furthermore, by extending the duration of each symbol in the time domain, we create a situation in which one symbol can interfere with the next. This is called intersymbol interference. The solution is something of a compromise, but nevertheless rather elegant. The shape of a sync function can be calculated so as to limit its duration in the time domain whilst also reducing its bandwidth in the frequency domain to an acceptable amount. There is still the possibility of intersymbol interference, but thanks to the insights of Swedish-American physicist Harry Nyquist and the work of American computer scientist Claude Shannon, this too can be dealt with. First, the digital data stream is line coded in the same way that line coding is done for BPSK. A polar non-return to zero signal is generated such that a binary one is represented by a positive voltage and a binary zero is represented by a negative voltage. This stream of symbols is then sampled to produce a stream of discrete impulses. For each impulse, a sync shape pulse is calculated. The calculations ensure that these sync pulses overlap in a particular way. Notice that whenever one sync pulse is at its maximum amplitude, all of the others have an amplitude of zero. This means that each time the receiver samples the incoming signal to determine the value of a symbol, there will be no interference from any of the other symbols. The sync pulses are then added together to produce a new smoothed out baseband signal. This is called a 2PAM signal. 2 because each sample that was used to create it encoded a 1 or a 0, and PAM because PAM is short for pulse amplitude modulation. The calculations needed to generate a signal like this are rather complex, but modern microprocessors can do them easily and in real time. The reverse process can also be done quickly and easily at the receiving end. The pulse-shaped baseband signal is now used to modulate a carrier wave, thereby generating a continuous radio signal. Now you might be thinking that to call this a pulse-shaped BPSK signal is inappropriate. We've just applied amplitude modulation to the 2PAM baseband signal, which is not phase modulation. Nevertheless, this technique is referred to as pulse-shaped BPSK because of the line coding that was employed at the start of the process. The critical importance of the line coding step will become more apparent when you see other ways that it can be done. After transmission, it's the job of the receiver to extract the digital information from the radio signal using what is essentially the same process in reverse. The signal is demodulated. Then, some additional data at the start of the signal allows a process known as a matched filter to synchronize with the transmitter and sample the demodulated signal at exactly the right moments. Ultimately, the binary data are recovered. To finish, let's take another look at the spectral efficiency of a pulse-shaped BPSK signal. This is what a square pulse looks like when viewed in the frequency domain. Of course, the harmonics extend infinitely in both directions. This type of information can be viewed as a power spectrum, in which the absolute value, that is, the magnitude of each harmonic is shown. The height of the chart, at any particular frequency, now represents the power of the signal at that frequency. This is what the power spectrum of a BPSK signal looks like without pulse shaping. This too extends infinitely in both directions. And here it is when pulse shaping is applied. Clearly a big improvement. Pulse-shaped BPSK has been around since the 1990s, when Wi-Fi standards were first established, 
and is still supported by most Wi-Fi enabled devices these days. Pulse-shaped BPSK is also used in mobile communication systems such as cellular networks because it's so efficient and reliable. It also performs extremely well where signals are weak and where there are high levels of interference.